right, Terrence. Okay, Jeff. He uh, didn't make me run any of the questions by him beforehand. So this is going to be fresh questions. I will say this, after I get through my interview with him, we will open it up for questions from all of you. So uh, be prepared to ask him something really, really, really hard. Personal, maybe, I don't know, whatever, whatever works for you. Uh, Terrence um, has been an amazing person to watch. You've been someone amazing to watch your growth. And um, I remember the first time I connected with you, and I remember all these moments along the way. And uh, one thing I always appreciate about you is that you have this quiet presence until you something comes out of you. And usually, even in this past year, this was a year of a pandemic, most people like sat back, right? Most people were in their homes. Yeah. And that is not what your story was this year, right? When, when most people get overwhelmed by problems, you tend to lean in. Um, what is that? What, what, what is that within you? What happened, what did you do this year and, and what is that within you? Yeah, so um, I wrote this quote that I want to share uh, one, one moment of grit could change everything about the trajectory of your mission and the lives of those who are around you. One moment of grit. Um, I remember being in the, our center, uh, it's not too far from here, and as the news were, was telling everybody to wash their hands, um, the CDC kept updating their guidelines, People were fighting in the grocery stores over toilet tissue and uh, paper towels. I was uh, literally before a man named Dimitri who said, man, I, I think I'm going to die because I, I don't have anywhere to wash my hands. Mm -hmm. um, that stung um, because we were just getting word that things were starting to close. You think about um, businesses were closing down. My favorite coffee shop went out of business. Um, libraries were starting to close, especially those uh, places where people experiencing homelessness may frequent for daytime shelter to access things like uh, technology and the uh, public restroom and to wash your hands and get uh, source information. Um, and this guy was literally telling me, hey man, if if I don't have anywhere to wash my hands, I'm hearing through the, the grapevine, so to speak, that I'll contract COVID-19. I don't know what it is, um, and I want to protect myself. And so traditionally, our organization has uh, used RV units to temporarily house people and walk with them out of the, uh, the plight of homelessness. And along the way, I learned early on that uh, RVs used as luxury items for people who have access to means and resources have all these fancy features like portable uh, cooking stations, uh, porta potties, right? Portable hand washing stations. And I'll never forget, I, I went home one day and I had this thought um, as CNN and all the news stations were kept saying, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. I was literally in my room, uh, the kitchen area, and my wife was over there cooking listening to music like she always does. And I just blurted out, I'm gonna put sinks in the street. Sinks. And she says, what? I said, yeah, go, go over and uh, wash your hands from the, uh, underneath our sink. And she walked over and she says, why am I doing this? I said, because nobody who is uh, living on the streets have, have that privilege. Mm. And we gotta figure a way to show up and be proximate uh, despite uh, COVID-19. And so we started with uh, five portable hand washing stations. Um, I had a couple friends pitch in and donate more. And um, over the last year, we have grown this Love Sinks In campaign to over uh, 56 cities around the United States of America. Uh, and we also have portable hand washing stations in uh, two additional countries. So 50, so you're in the kitchen, you decide yeah. to do this one thing, you Google probably like, how do I make a yeah. hand washing station? I, I mean, what? How well, do, firstly, I, I, went, I went on homedepot.com because <laughs> everybody shops at Home Depot. And I was just looking at sinks and I was like, you know, I don't, I'm not a carpenter or whatever. 
And, you know, I, I didn't know how to build a sink that could be self-contained. And so I started doing research on um, RV part shops. Okay. And so I connected with someone and they said, yeah, we have all of these parts um, that makes a portable hand washing station. And that's when it clicked for me. So then you, you built one and then you realized you ran out of, this is, I'm doing a little backstory. Yeah, sure. You ran, it ran out of water really fast. Yeah. Right? Yes. So the problem was um, each of these portable hand washing stations has like this tank at the bottom. It has a foot pedal. You uh, press your foot on it and it shoots up water through the spout out of the nozzle into the basin so people have access to wash their hands. And it has a gray water drain that gives the um, gray water ability to drain away into something. And I realized that we had to continue to keep up with all of the tanks that were emptying out every, every other day. Mm. You know, uh, they were in crowded areas where literally we would sometimes have to go out onto the streets and fill the uh, basins of the tanks up maybe two or three times in a day. Uh, we had to keep them sanitized uh, just to ensure the safety of those who would be accessing this. And then I started to realize that I could use more of a decentralized approach. And what I mean by that is start to empower other people who are also on the front lines. Mm. And that's when we multiply. So 56 cities, I think you said, how many washing stations? Over a thousand. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, people like uh, the NFL Foundation, uh, Porsche, uh, Brownie Paper Towels, they featured in the uh, commercial Coca-Cola, um, At V. Um, and this all happened. Southwest Airlines. It's been one year. Yeah, just one year. Yeah. All of these companies from all over uh, just stepped up and like partnered with our organization to ensure that we were able to disseminate uh, this critical resource all over the country. The most important story though is uh, we were able to resource uh, chapter leaders on the Navajo Nation reservation um, wow. and we resourced uh, over a hundred chapter houses with this critical resource because uh, uh, indigenous people on the Navajo Nation had to literally drive an hour and a half away to fill up these gigantic water tanks just so people could have access to running water. And most people, I think, we're going to get into the content, but I just want to give a little context. Okay. <laughs> um, most people get overwhelmed when they think about problems like that, mm. right? Yeah. Y you something I love about you, is that you just kind of jump at it knowing you don't really have it all figured out, right? Yeah. And then you're like, we'll f we will figure it out. And you did figure it out, right? And is that the grit that you think, that you, that you think about? Yeah. Um, I've always thought of possibility in the midst of crisis mm. instead of allowing the crisis or the obstacle itself to overwhelm me to the to the point where I can't see anything good that can come out of it I don't know why I'm like that but anytime there is some type of obstacle I start to look around um, to find what is the new thing that will emerge or what is the, the new lesson that I can learn from this? Because what actually happens when, I, when I, I just take a moment to look around, I really I start to discover that there are opportunities right before me that I never even witnessed. Hmm. I mean, for instance, you think about, I had uh, you know, experience working with RV units. They had always been there. We still work with them from time to time, you know? And it's like, here's a crisis moment. And while everybody else is shutting down, there is a resource that had already been around me that just ignited me. Hmm. Because I'm always thinking to myself, how can I continue to show up even if I don't have everything that I think I need in the moment? Um, and that is what keeps me going because as you're on a, any entrepreneurship journey, you're never going to have all of the, the things available. Mm -hmm. 
ever. <laughs> you know, it's just like the one step in front of the other. And so I always ask myself, what is the one step that I can safely take with courage that I can manage myself? Um, and as I take those steps, other steps begin to illuminate and um, I just keep taking steps. Safely step with courage. I, it's interesting you say that because that's not what I would, how I would explain you. <laughs> I would be like, I mean, if you don't know Terrence's journey, he has, first time I met him, I think you were living on a, a billboard. Oh, yeah. Do you have that picture? Yeah. What was um, that? Yeah, so this church had given our organization this bus for $1.00. And I was at a gas station one time, and this is what I'm talking about, being uh, fully aware and immersed into your surroundings. I saw this guy digging into the dumpster, and um, I walk over to him, I engage him in a conversation. He was looking for lunch in a trash can. And we got into this conversation, I learned this story, and I said, hey man, if you could have one thing to change your life, what would that be? And he says, I wish I could be made over. Hmm. And so in the spirit of uh, my friend and brother, uh, I started to view this vehicle as a makeover unit. And so I launched a campaign, nobody gave, it was a crowdfunding thing, C crowdfunding had just started, and you had to raise a certain amount of money within a certain time frame. And I'll never forget sitting frustrated around the dinner table around Thanksgiving with my wife and a couple friends. And I was like, man, I just need to give up. And my wife looks at me and she says, no, you're not going to give up. And I say, well, what am I going to do? Live on top of the bus? <laughs> and she says, yeah, that's what you need to do. <laughs> and so that led me to... Uh, How long are you up there? Yeah, my friend built this, uh, this, this uh, living quarters, and I lived on top of that bus for an entire month. Um, but that's not the cool part of the story. Uh, the bus was actually made over. It mobilized all of these people from all walks of life, all volunteer driven, um, come and they start to like literally transform this bus. The news station, Channel 11, paid for the wrap on the bus. Mm. Um, and I started to learn that in order uh, for your mission to survive and soar, you will need grit. But this is the story that I had no clue about. And so I'm living on top of this bus. I come down, the bus is transformed. Uh, about two weeks after that, I meet Jamil. Jamil is a barber student that was at a local uh, barber institute. And I'm driving around and I say, I gotta find barbers and beauticians and all this stuff. We gotta change some lives. We gotta make people over in the spirit of uh, my friend Bernard. And I come across this barber institute I go in and I say, hey, do you think, uh, do you know any barbers that would want to get involved and help make some people over? We got this bus, et cetera. And this guy says, I know this perfect guy, his name is Jamil. He calls Jamil, the very next Saturday, Jamil starts uh, coming onto the bus and he kept coming and he kept coming. And I was like, wow, this guy's young and he's volunteering. Like what is driving him to want to cut people experiencing homelessness hair for free, you know? Little did I find out that uh, Jamil's father was experiencing homelessness. And as a matter of fact, he was saying to me, man, I'm just hoping one day that on this bus, I'll be able to cut my own dad's hair. I haven't seen him since I graduated from wow. high school. And a couple months later, he got a chance to do that. We ran into his father uh, on ML King in the city of Atlanta. Uh, his dad gets on the bus. His dad didn't even know he was a barber. Hmm. That's how long he had been out of touch. His brother is on the bus. Jamil is on the bus. And I'm just watching this moment. And I'm like in tears because I'm like, they, I, I, didn't have, I had no clue that like staying on top of a bus would like reunite this, this father and these sons, you know. And we get off the bus. They embrace. They hug and they start to keep in touch. Well, two weeks later, Jamil's father checks into a, um, a program 
And almost four years later, he's been off of the streets. He graduated, got a job, and now he has his own place. Mm. And that's what I mean when I say, you know, when you're faced with a, an obstacle uh, that's before you, before you start decide to, decide to tap out, you must ask yourself, does this obstacle before me speak truly about uh, my worth, my skill set, my vision, my cause, or is it temporary? And that's what I had to learn. Mm. So there was the bus. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, I, you don't have to tell every story, but I just, I, I just, <laughs> I'm thinking back of the time I've known you. There was the bus. There was a trailer. There was a, um, a container that you turned into the first ever homeless museum. Is that is that what you called it? Sorry, I'm like yeah. a Dignity Museum. I'm sorry, yeah. Dignity Museum. I think I got that up there. Oh, there it is, Dignity Museum. Um. I kept, I keep, I, I still get asked these questions. What is homelessness really not like, or what is um, poverty uh, really like? And so, in my heart of hearts, I believe that education leads to empathy, and that empathy equips us to respond well. Can you say we that one more time? To. Education can lead to empathy, and empathy gives us an opportunity to respond well. You know, I think we have an empathy deficit in our country and society. Um, Henry Nouwen puts it this way when he's talking about compassion. He says, true compassion is when you leave your world and enter into the world of another, and you weep with those who weep, you suffer with those who suffer, you mourn with those who mourn. All of these wonderful attributes about being present and proximate to people and showing them that they are worth it, right? And that's what I wanted to create with uh, the Dignity Museum is, you know, we wanted to create a space that would give people an opportunity to pause their world long enough to enter into a, the world of another to understand what it's like on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reason why we show, chose a shipping container is because there's parallels with a shipping container and the issue of homelessness. Every shipping container has an origin story. Every shipping container is transient. It moves around from place to place. And every shipping container has things that it carries that are of worth and value. Hmm. It's just like the experience of homelessness. Every person experiencing this plight moves around from place to place. You know, it carries uh, he or she or they may carry things of worth and value and they all have stories and narratives. And the beautiful thing about it is that you have to go inside to really see the beauty, which is powerful. Uh, we developed and coded an app that has technology and virtual reality and all of these things that gives you an opportunity to really wrestle with some of the embedded narratives uh, that are in most cases false about people who we view as criminal. And uh, yeah, so that's Dignity Museum. So then there's a museum, and then you walked somewhere in the midst of this. You walked to Washington, <laughs> D.C. from Atlanta. You walked to Memphis from Atlanta. Yeah. It, it goes on and on. So your creativity is endless in relation to these projects. But listen, yeah. a lot of people in the startup scene, they, they say that the secret sauce is hustle. But you say grit is what is most important, right? What do you think the difference is between those two things? Grit and hustle? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, think, I think there are a lot of people hustling for things that aren't even really in their heart. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's easy to work and work and work and uh, tire yourself out and you have no affinity towards the thing that you're burning yourself out for. I'm talking about the type of grit where, where when you are engaged in this type of uh, in this type of mission or your cause that you will weather all of the seasons of life look man I, I wrote down uh, something that I wanted to share uh, which I think is important um, there's a difference between interest and commitment when you're interested in something you will only do it when it's convenient. Mm -hmm. 
But when you're committed to something, you do it because it's necessary. And I think that is the difference um, for me. I'm not saying that I don't hustle. I'm saying that I, I maintain my certain level of resilience so I don't fall out of love with the thing that I love to do. That's the difference, right? Um, there are so many people who may find themselves who started out doing what they love to do and they've been hustling for it, but they've lost the luster and the, the love for the thing that they're doing. And I normally define or uh, use the metaphor of a dating relationship when it comes to vision, right? Uh, you get a vision, right? And you start to see it. Oh, it's cute vision, you know? <laughs> You're moving around and you start to like the vision a little more and you ask the vision to go out, right? You go out on a date with the vision, you start dating the vision, and then all of a sudden, you get really serious with the vision, and you're telling everybody about this vision. Look, I'm with this vision, right? But then soon, it transitions into, man, me and this vision are serious. I gotta marry the vision. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm married to the, to the vision, and I think if you're doing any uh, social entrepreneurship endeavor or any business, you gotta be married to the vision. And if you know anything about relationships, relationships goes through various seasons, mm. right? Um, but you maintain the love by putting in the work both for it and also internally is what I'm talking about. So there's a longevity and a perseverance that goes with that. I mean, yeah. we talk a lot on our team about it's very, it's very common, like if there wasn't a personal story related to that problem these people are trying to address, oh, they, yeah. they quit, right? You've seen it, I've seen it. Yeah. Um, how, I, I'm thinking about, I, I have a feeling your perseverance side of things really came out on your walk. Mm. Um, <laughs> unpack that a little bit for us. On my walk? walk in terms of a campaign or personal journey? Specifically, probably to Memphis, but it could be both. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I guess one of the things, another thing that I jotted down, my stepfather used to always tell me, you keep your vision solid, but your, your plan's fluid. <laughs> and it's the law of pliability. The greater your vision, the greater your pliability needs to be because at any given moment, plans can change. I learned that. That just because your plans change doesn't necessarily mean that you are failing. Mm. Maybe the plans changing may lead you into a direction that is more suitable uh, for your growth and your development that will cause you to soar even more. And so I remember I made the decision I was going to walk from Atlanta, Georgia, all the way to um, Memphis, Tennessee, to the Lorraine Motel uh, in partnership with the SELC and the NAACP and all these organizations to bring attention to poverty uh, to commemorate Martin King's 50th um, passing. And so, um, I start the journey from the Center for Civil and Human Rights we have this, this big crowd, um, people are rally, people start off the walk with me. And um, I walk and walk and walk, and 10 days later, um, like really far west, and I'm getting closer and closer to Alabama. And I start to experience um, mistreatment and like, some racism. Um, the entire walk I had, the police called on me over 20 times. And um, I started to walk and walk and walk. And one of my friends um, literally took off work to walk the rest of the way with me because it was so much mistreatment. And I'll never forget, I was walking through a very small town. It was in a rural part of uh, Alabama. 
and uh, these trucks would stop and yell at me and uh, follow me around. I had a few trucks try to hit me and all that stuff. And I'll never forget texting some of my uh, friends and I was like, like, yo, I don't think I should continue this. And they were like, well, is this the work that you're called to do? And that question from one of my friends caused me to think about the greater picture or the, the, the greater vision of what I was trying to communicate. And it was this, that I was in a small rural town and there were people experiencing poverty that was discriminating against me, but I was walking for poverty. And I had to come to realize that even the, per the persons that was discriminating against me, I was walking for. And it gave me the courage to continue to walk and bring attention and awareness to this issue that Martin King actually died for um, to continue to speak up and out uh, about the issue of poverty in our country. And so I had to view those people who were opposing me as also the people that I was there for and to love and to advocate for, which is was a deeper level of grit. <laughs> mm. So if somebody's in the midst of a hard season right now, which I mean, yeah, I feel like everyone, if you if you're like, well, how are you doing? Like, well, it's been a hard year. You know, they all have their story related to this year. How would what what would you say to someone? Um, that's listening, that needs encouragement, that needs, they're on their walk in a different way that needs to take another step. Um, what immediately comes to mind, and I have written some stuff down, but I'll say this, uh, is don't compare, don't complain, and don't compete. It's three C's. Don't compare, don't complain, don't compete. Comparison is the thief of joy. It will rob you of every imagination that may be in your heart mm -hmm. because you are comparing yourself to someone else. Or you may look at somebody else and say, I had a really rough year and so-and-so had a really great year, and you can fall into the comparison trap, and you never know where you are in your social location on your journey and your growth and your development. And what comparison does, it causes us to self-reject ourselves, to literally reject our visions and say, our vision compared to so-and-so's vision isn't even, look at my vision, my, my vision is really small. And, Oftentimes thinking about like um, a puzzle box and puzzle pieces, all of the pieces in the box make the, the grander picture, right? It doesn't matter what size the piece, it matters if the piece that is um, possessed by the person who has it offers it up. No matter what piece you have, be faithful over that piece and don't compare that piece to anybody else's piece in the box uh, because it's the collective uh, contribution of all of the pieces I'm talking in the uh, analogy coming together that creates the tapestry of social change. Own your peace. Oh, that's uh, double entendre, right? Own your peace. I see what you like, did there. You see what I did? I okay. Um, <laughs> the second thing, don't compare, don't complain. Man, you talk about, I, I have, I've made a, a practice. Um, and I use this practice as it relates to grit. Whenever I feel like my back is against the wall, I count my gratefuls. I literally have to force myself to make a grateful list. And there are times when I am, uh, I, I tear that list up and I, I start again, but there are so many things all around us that we have to be grateful for um, and one of the reasons why I do this is because I'm constantly engaged in conversations with people who have absolutely nothing. And I think in society and culture, we have used the wrong metric systems to define worth and value uh, to begin with. We use all of the extrinsic things like 
you know, what kind of car I drive, where do I go to school, where do you get your coffee, who do you run with, where did you graduate from, and all of these things we use to define worth and value, but real worth is intrinsic, because dignity is inherent. And so, when I'm in constantly close proximity to people um, experiencing homelessness or don't have an address, like I'm constantly reminded of all of the little and small things that, you know, this cup right here, you know, this cup may be thrown away in a trash can that has a little water in it and somebody might go into the trash can and use the, the last drop of water to brush their teeth. You know, so I'm, I, count your gratefuls. What, what do you have right now at your disposal? What's left, right? Uh, most people think that um, starting again is the same thing as starting over. No, <laughs> you know, starting over is like starting from rubble, like nothing, nothing. Some of us just need to realize that we're not starting over, we're starting again, uh, just like the video. Mm. See what I did? I, yeah, I like that, I need to take you on the road with me. Yeah, um, well yeah, don't complain, count your gratefuls. I would, for, uh, I would um, challenge you to make a grateful list. You know, do you still have a, one person on your team? Do you still have a vision? Do you still have dreams? It, it has a person still donated, even if that donation was $5. Like there are so many different things you can count to like reignite mm. the fire within. And uh, last one is uh, don't compete. Um, and we've all seen the, the meme before, but I mean, there's some validity to it. The person that you should be in competition with is the last best version of yourself. The comp your competition? Like I'm not competing with anybody else. I know what I'm called to do. I, I, know, I know my cause. I'm just trying to develop and become the best leader that I can be so my life and my legacy bears witness to all those who have had an opportunity to watch. I often tell people, I'm not hustling for my first name, I'm hustling for my last. Uh, because I want my kids to see this example so they can carry on this legacy. Mm. And I don't have time to like, uh, you know, be in competition with anybody because I'm in competition with the last best version of myself. Can I improve? Can I get better? Can I continue to learn? Can I learn more? Can I articulate that better? Can I be a better husband, a better father, a better leader, a better social entrepreneur, a better dreamer, mm. a better person that represents what grit is, is really, so yeah. Sometimes I think about like, as a visionary myself, yeah. I get, I, th I have a new idea, I wanna pursue it, and then I think to myself, I gotta rally all these people again. I gotta, I gotta do it again. Do they even really, are they tired of me asking them to give to this thing? Are they, right, like, do you ever, can you relate with that? Yeah, um, I can somewhat. But if, if we go back to, I think you said something earlier about what you observed in me, like you just, like I think you said something to the effect, you just go with it. Mm. Um, because it's too important. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, that's pretty much how I get past my fear of rejection. Mm. Um, one of the things that I did early on before I started my organization was I came up with a list of things that I would deem as success. Those things look drastically different from what society and culture says is successful. The reason I did that, made that list, is because when times got lean, or when uh, there is very easy to slip off into like the celebrations or the big times, and then like you may have a low moment, I wanted to stay even keeled or um, kind of consistent. And so while people may celebrate, oh, look, you were in a Coca-Cola commercial, blah, 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 you know, it's like, I don't get joy from that. I get joy from knowing um, Virgil's name, who needs a shower. And as long as I know his name, none of that stuff matters. And that's just one person, right? And as long as I keep those one stories before me, or those things that are at my core that's, that connects to my personal story that I didn't share, like that's what gives me life.
Because mm -hmm. I know what it's like to sleep in a park and not know where a meal is going to come from at 16 and a half years old. And then go to school after you stayed up all night and have educators look at you and label you and, don't, and not understand why you're falling asleep in class because you are experiencing temporary homelessness as a teenager. Like, I know what it feels like to be unseen. And so now that I am seen, I'm going to make sure those who are unseen feel seen. And that's what I focus on. If there is one last thought you'd give people today, well, first of all, it feels like your guiding light is definitely like different. When you're thinking about your list of success items, I, I, in my head, I just was contrasting it with like, the, kid, the, the Tiger Woods story of he had like this list of all the championships he was gonna have on the wall. And, oh wow. And he, have you ever heard this? No. And he slept with it up on the wall like he had to beat Jack Nicholas in all these categories. That was his goal. Oh wow. And your view of success is just a different framework. Yeah. How do we gain that? How do, how do you not fall into the trap of like, well, I did a book and I need to do more books. I did this, I need to do more of this. I did, the, you know what I mean? How do you keep that well, guiding light straight? Well, I think there's always this urge, like I always have the urge to want to innovate and try new projects and launch new ideas. Um, but I, I don't view them as the end all. Like they're not my, the trophy in my heart. They're vehicles vehicles to help me advocate better, vehicles to in, uh, bring me into more relationships where I can advocate more, vehicles to um, uh, organize people or mobilize people to go back to the, the list that I just mentioned, mm -hmm. which is to see people um, who don't have an address. And so it's a strategy. It's not necessarily the thing that I'm pursuing. And I understand that as an entrepreneur, I need to have certain strategies to move the needle so I can do what I'm really passionate to do, which is to get other people to see people who aren't seen. And I think that is the thing that probably differentiates me from, I don't know who you may have in mind, but like, um, yeah, that's the thing that stands out. So I don't view the, those things as things that I'm pursuing for myself, I view them as vehicles that will get me somewhere to help me advocate more for other people. I love it. You got a book coming out Tuesday. Yeah. Have you done a pitch on anything yet? This is your chance. You got to pitch me. Why should I buy your book? Why? Yeah. <laughs> because you're my friend. I probably <laughs> already pre-ordered it, but you got to give me a better pitch than that. Come on no, now. So, what am I going to learn? Yeah. So it's called When We Stand, The Power of Seeking Justice Together. A uh, short story, which is real, um, we experience social media trauma from the palm of our hands. At any given moment, you can pick up your, hand, uh, your phone and encounter uh, all types of injustices from all around the world at one moment, in one time, right? And so what happens is uh, a number of people get really overwhelmed by that. I mean, I've been overwhelmed before. And I'm, you can, that overwhelming feeling can cause you to be paralyzed, where you do nothing with it. And so what I think there is a lot of willing people, but there are not a lot of available people. And this book is helping people to, to realize that whatever they have to contribute in community with others makes the difference that we're all desiring to see. Did I do good with that? That was good. Okay, yeah, was cool, good. cool. All right, let's <laughs> open up for like maybe three or four questions for Terrence. Based on